Well, tonight we are going to kind of, I want you to think about 2015. This is the purpose of December 27th, the last Sunday of the year. Obviously not the last day of the year, but I probably won't be with any of you. And so um, I find that it is helpful to live, in order to live a life of intentionality, it takes um, pretty consistent and regular pauses to reflect and to plan. Now, it probably sounds like a very unspiritual practice, but I don't think so. Um, because to me, the kingdom of God is all about moving things forward. It's all about launching into where the kingdom of darkness is present, bringing out the kingdom of God, making things good and beautiful and peaceful and hopeful and all the things that are in the kingdom of God as it is in heaven. We're trying to bring that here to earth. That's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. And so when we talk about changing our society, changing our culture, changing ourselves... We have to plan that. We have to think ahead. Now, I know that in our culture, in Summit County, thinking ahead is not always the highest value slash priority on people's <laughs> list, okay? I, I mean, I, I literally have lost count. I'm not just saying this is hyperbole of how many people I've met who did not really think much about the move here, right? So the car's packed up full, there's no job, there's no place to live, there's nothing. They don't know anybody here, and yet here they come. So that's beautiful. I mean, there's a very pioneering spirit about people who do that and end up here, and I think it's lovely. We have far more pioneers than in most places, in that sense, who will just get up and move across the country. Like, who does that? Like, 82% of our county, apparently, or whatever. Um, It's beautiful, but it does kind of, sometimes we're thin, Because if we don't plan ahead, um, sometimes we don't end up in the place that we wanted to be in 25 years, right? So um, it's wonderful that people are working as lifties when they're 55, but if that's what they want to do until they die, that's great. But if they want to do anything else before they die, like spend time somewhere else or have a house to live in, then they probably have to plan a little differently. And so depending on our values, our values are the thing that our planning should stem from. So if something is a value to me, Um, like having kids was a value to us. And so we were um, more than happy to set aside some plans and goals in order to see that one come to pass. So in some areas, we've given up things that other people get. Like we can't just pick up and do whatever we want all the time. That freedom, at some point, some of that freedom has been lost. But we gain this other thing. And the beauty of it is it's all based on what we valued to begin with. So if we value... Um, one thing, then we'll see those things come around. If we value another thing, we'll see other things come around. But it is still very possible, even with whatever values we have, to kind of wander through life just going where life takes you. Have you ever met anybody who's just kind of going where life takes them? If you've lived in Summit County for more than two and a half minutes, you've met somebody who's just going wherever life takes them. And life happened to bring them here for a little while, right? And then they're probably going to, life's going to take them somewhere else after a little while. And that's great, but as believers... We have given our lives to God. If I call myself a believer in Jesus, I don't just get to say that intellectually I am agreeing with these tenets of the faith. I have actually agreed to follow a rabbi as a disciple. So wherever Jesus goes, that's where I go. If he puts his foot here, that's where I put my foot. If he goes that way, I, put, I go that way. Wherever he goes, wherever the Holy Spirit leads, that's where we go. We don't have a choice anymore anymore. We don't get rights anymore. We don't get to sit back and say that's not fair anymore, ever again. We don't get to do that ever again. Now, sometimes we get our feelings hurt with God or, you know, something really bad happens and we don't think it's fair. And so we can pitch fits and stuff like that. That's what we do. You know, we're kids. We do that sometimes. But eventually we always come back to the point of like, or we should always come back to the point of, did I choose this life or did I not? Because if I chose to follow him, I don't have any more rights and I don't get to say no to him. And I don't get to say, oh, I'd rather do this other thing. And so if we're following God, most of the year we talked about the kingdom dream as opposed to the American dream, right? The kingdom dream is very different. The dream that we see, the dream that I see in my my mind's eye of what I want my life to look like, if I am blessed to live a long life here on earth, when I am dying one day, to be able to look back at my life and say, did I live according to what Jesus told me to do? Was I the kind of person that people could look up to or respect or even in some way model their life after? Because I mean, that's what Paul says, imitate me as I imitate him. What are the sorts of things that I would have to be doing now to be that person? Because often we can say, oh, it'll just happen. 
I'll just become that. Or that thing will just end up, you know, the way it is. But that's not how life works. Life takes us whatever direction it wants to take us unless we decide it's going to take us somewhere else. The flow of traffic here only goes in one direction, and I call it slackerdom. I don't know. That's just a word. I don't know if that's an actual word. It, it, it flows us toward value, experiences, and a um, 100 days on the mountain, and work as many jobs as you have to, and never see you know, anybody that you don't need to, and never have to have anybody depend on you. That's what Summit County teaches us. And if we go, if we jump along that stream and we just let life take us wherever we're going to take us, we're going to be alone. We're not going to have a single person around us because I can guarantee you already our Western culture wants to take us into individualism every chance it gets. And then you add the fact that we have something like four to five times the amount of introverts here as in other places. And then you add the beautiful mountains and all the really fun things that there are to do that you don't really need anybody else to do. I mean, we talk about going skiing with someone, but we don't really ski with people, right? You just kind of like head down and then eventually you get to the bottom and cool, high five, we did it. It's not like hiking in the summer. It's like there's no conversation usually happening in the midst of that. Even the activities that we're doing with people are not really with people. So we could find ourselves going a a completely different direction than the way the kingdom of God tells us to go. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and he's talking about the day of judgment, okay? So he's talking about the end of all time when we will all be judged. Now, I know that's not fantastic and it's not a really wonderful, fun thing to think about, but that is what's going to happen at the end of time. Whenever Jesus decides to come back, we will be standing before him and he will say, hey, let's see what you did with your life. I mean, he was, he was there, you know, so he kind of knows, but let's show you what you did with your life, what your priorities were, what your values were, whether you served and loved people, whether you served, whether you loved yourself, whether you received my love. And in the context of talking about this day of judgment, he's warning them. And here's what he's trying to remind them of. Even though right here what you see is life and Keystone and Breckenridge and a basin with no lines or veil with unlimited, you know, runs that nobody's on, whatever it is that we see as we walk around, our jobs, our lives, our friends, our jobs, our lives, our friends, skiing, our jobs, Right? No matter what you think you see down here, there, there are certainties that we don't see every day. And that's all the spiritual stuff that's going on, and especially the future. And so let's not be unaware that one day we are going to kind of account for it. That's what stewardship means. Someone hands me something, and I use it in the way that they would use it, and then one day I give it back. And so when God says we are stewards of his kingdom... He says, here it is. I had to leave the earth and the Holy Spirit's here to help you, but I I would expect you to use it, to use, I don't, maybe that's not the right word, to, to be with people, your children, your finances, the environment, everybody around you who you can to do what you, what I would do in that particular situation. Use those things the way I would do. The way a king will go off and leave a steward in charge and then come back and say, what'd you do with all my stuff? Because none of the stuff actually belongs to the steward. All the stuff belongs to the king. So there's nothing that actually belongs to me. Nothing. I came into the world with nothing. I will leave the world with nothing because none of it belongs to me, right? So we think of things as ours, my house, my things, my kids, my whatever, my church. You are my church to the extent that I belong to you, but not to the extent that you belong to me. Like, I have nothing. All I'm doing is stewarding the things that belong to the king. And so one day the king will come back and say, how'd you do? And if we say, well, I did okay with this part, but all that other stuff over there doesn't, doesn't look so great. It's kind of overrun, and these people started fighting, and I just let them do it because, man, I was tired. And I had stuff to do with my life, so I didn't really want to pay attention to that much. And, of course, there were people who were in need, but somebody else would probably handle that. And if Jesus were here, what would he be doing with his life? That's what a king asks of the steward. And so one day, as representatives of his kingdom, we will say, here you go. It's really imperfect. There's a lot of failings in there, but I, I think I tried. And he'll say, well done. Very good. That's the hope, right? <laughs> That's what we're going for. Not if we just float along and let life take us where it's going to. So this is what Paul is telling the Thessalonians. But friends, you're not in the dark. So how could you be taken off guard by any of this? You're sons of light, daughters of day. We live under wide open skies and know where we stand. So let's not sleepwalk through life like those others. Let's keep our eyes open and be smart. People sleep at night and get drunk at night, but not us. 
Since we're creatures of day, let's act like it. Walk out into the daylight sober, dressed up in faith, love, and the hope of salvation. So once again, I I think I know what a drunk person looks like because I've lived in Summit County for quite a while. So I see them on the main street in Breckenridge at Oktoberfest a lot, right? So staggering, stumbling, open to suggestion, right? Like this is why drunk people are hilarious because whatever anybody says to do, they'll just do like the, 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 their soberness of mind literally is gone. That's what it means. And, and floating along with whatever happens, if they're drunk enough, I guess. And he's like, hey, these things happen at night. You're people of the light, You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so you don't need to just let life take you wherever. Actually, wake up. Because whatever you see around you, which I guarantee you looked a little different to them in the first century in Thessalonica than it does to us in Summit County in these days, but still, it's still all the world stuff. It's still all the natural stuff that we see around. Whatever you see around you is not really the truth. I mean, it is, but it's just the shadow, right? If, if we let ourselves get sidetracked and think this is actually it, then we're just going to sleepwalk through life. And when we sleepwalk through life, we end up, I don't know, wherever people push us around. I've never seen anybody sleepwalking um, in real life, but it would be really fun, right? <laughs> like, here they come. Ooh, let's put them over there. Let's stick them in this place. I mean, it would be so, you know, cruel, but fun, you know, in a sense of like, they can't, you know, stop or turn around and say, dude, cut it out. You know, like they're not going to do that. They're asleep. When we're sober minded, that's when we're like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why am I in this place? Why am I saying that? Why am I reacting this way? Am I acting like a steward of God's kingdom? Or am I just acting like everybody else? When we stop sleepwalking, we stop saying, oh, me, 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 me. (laughs) Aspen, Daddy didn't give me what I want. I mean, that's, that's me sometimes, right? That's me to us sometimes. Oh, it's all about me. It doesn't matter that people are dying and going to hell every day. <laughs> I didn't get the job I wanted. I didn't get the things I wanted. I didn't get what I want for Christmas. Right? <laughs> I mean, think about it. Life takes us in some selfish places if we let it. Everything is about me. That is the foundation of sin itself. Myself. That's what it comes down to every time. Me. What feels right for me, what makes me feel valued, what makes me feel appreciated, what makes me feel important. If this person makes me feel unimportant, ugh. If this person cuts me off in some way, ugh. If that person requires something of me that's inconvenient, ugh. So as we're living life soberly, because we're creatures of day, let's act like it. Now, how do we do that? We look behind and we look ahead. These regular routine pauses where we stop. Now, we try to do it really regularly. That's basically what we do in our discipleship huddles. What is God saying to me? What am I going to do about it? What has God been saying to me this last week? What am I going to do about it this week? Smart goal. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's pretty practical, or it should be. It's pretty applicable right here in the moment. But this is to look back at an entire year and to look forward to an entire year. Because think about it. The last 360 one days, is that right? We'll never get back again. They're done. Whatever decisions we made, whatever values we lived out, there it is. Staring us in the face, 2015. Now here we have unlimited potential to see what God will do in the next year. Unlimited potential. Who knows what God will want to do? My mind is not big enough or hopeful enough or faith-filled enough to imagine Uh, I can tell you that last year, this time, I really wouldn't have imagined this, even for our church. The kind of growth that we've seen in in our lives, personally, as a family. I would definitely have never seen the tragedy that we've been through this last year. I would never have seen any of it. I could not have even imagined. But the, the ways that God brings growth and loves us and holds us close, I mean, I wouldn't give any of it back. Not a single thing. Because I, I feel closer to him and I know him better. And that's what we want. I mean, believe me, it is not a perfect year in my hindsight. It's, and all the good stuff is because of him. Do you know what I'm saying? We're not looking back, patting ourselves on the back, saying, woohoo, we did all this stuff great. It's all because of him. But to be able to stay close to him and say, okay, hmm, 
this is probably something I could have done a little differently. This is probably something I could tweak. This is an area that I'd really like to put some intentionality and effort into. And remember, when we talk about our behaviors, we're always talking about kingdom. Covenant is where our identity comes from, and we are his no matter what we do. My kids will be my kids no matter what they do. But I would love for them to make great choices, right? And that's kingdom stuff. He really would love for us to make great choices because other people are watching. First of all, they're better for us, right? I mean, the fact is, I don't know, I have a daughter that is so frightening. Out of eight, eight cousins, 11 by the end of next year, Aspen is the only girl. And it is frightening. I have, I have four sisters. One of them's in the back. My twin sister, Leah, run the slides. Um, five of us and Aspen is the only girl so far. And I am mortified. <laughs> And Eric and I have talked about it. How do we navigate all this stuff, all this crap that society puts on girls? And I just thought, you know what? The only way that I know how to do it is show her what sin does up close. The same with our boys. If you decide to be promiscuous, this is what you get at the end. Does it look fun? No. It looks horrendous, right? All of a sudden, your value is placed in places it shouldn't, and you're running after things and people that that you should never be even interested in your, your sense of worth is in the toilet. That's why I want her to make those choices because in the end, God tells us to do things and not do things for our own benefit first because he loves his kids and then secondarily for everybody who's watching. Because currently, if, if the statistics are still current, 96% of our county does not know Christ. And so they're all watching us. And you know what they should be? They're not looking for perfection. They don't need perfection. They need honest, real transformation. They need somebody to be able to say, I don't know what I'm doing. I do know I'm doing it quite imperfectly and probably dysfunctionally. And I'm not even sure that you should watch me, but I'm headed in this direction. And if you want to come along, that's it. That's what it means to be a disciple and to bring along disciples. So let's look at a couple of areas. Um, These are I'm going to quick kind of go through them just to remind you of the things that we talked about this year. The five capitals, so that you can be listening to the Lord. And just a couple of reminders about what sermons are for. I do love to talk, but they're really not for that. <laughs> they're really not just so I can get up and say stuff and stick it on a podcast. Um, they are always to be lived out and to be acted upon. Because remember, we hear from God, what is God saying? And then we go do something about it. So I'm, the whole reason for us to be here tonight is to prompt that sort of kairos, that moment in time when God speaks in you. That's it. That's my job is to say, where is God speaking to you? And then if you ever want to talk about it or have somebody, you have all these people here or me to say, I think God was saying this. How do you think, what, what would be an idea of how to live it out? That's what we're here for. God is speaking to you. And, and we're just here to help pull that out and see it grow, right? Every week. So here are the five capitals. Spiritual capital, which is love, power, and wisdom. All the stuff that we consider typically spiritual disciplines and stuff like that come under that. Relational capital, friends and family. Good ones, right? So we all have friends and family who are not necessarily investing extra into our lives. They might be taking, they might be making a few more withdrawals than deposits. You know what I'm saying? And we talk about capitals, but the good ones that we want to, we want to kind of keep the relationship going. Physical capital is literally time and health. Intellectual capitals are creativity and knowledge. Remember, creativity is ideas that come from you or come from the Lord and knowledge is ideas you learn from other people. There are wonderful, there's wonderful knowledge and creativity locked up inside of you that other people need. And that's where we learn how to increase our capital and give it away. And then financial capital is money. And remember, according to the kingdom dream, which is not the same as the American dream, this is the order pretty much. The middle ones could maybe be moved around a little bit, but the first and the last one are definitely what Jesus teaches. And the ones in the middle are pretty close. And where my sister lives in D.C., I'm pretty sure, according to those values, where she lives at least and the people that she hangs with, financial capital would be on the top, Intellectual capital would probably be next, right? Spiritual capital is definitely at the bottom. Who cares what's going on spiritually? Nobody's walking around showing off their spiritual capital. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's showing off their boats and their houses and talking about which school their kid can get into if they work really hard in preschool, right? (laughs) So in that sort of environment, this is not... In our environment, it's the same thing. We might need to make up some new categories for Summit County, like... um, I don't know, so your, your, your ski and snowboard capital. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you, Lacey. Stick it somewhere right up at the top, 
right? Because nobody here cares much what kind of house you live in, but you better have a nice mountain bike when you get out this summer. You better make sure that you are shredding it up and down, or I really don't have time. I mean, Eric was talking about the other day, he's like, a homeless dude here could be famous if he really knows how to ski. I mean, that's, that's, those are the interesting ways that our values come out here, which I kind of love, but we also still always, every culture has values that don't line up with kingdom principles. Everyone, whether you're here or you're in Denver or you're in DC or you're in Cambodia, no matter where we are, there's are some, every culture will have something out of whack. And as missionaries, which we all are called to be on the mission of God, we have to look at our culture and say, these are the neutral things. I can use those. Here are the positive ones. Sweet. Already got those in place. And here are all the negative ones that do not line up with kingdom stuff that I'm just going to have to plow right stinking through. Like, like the non-committal thing here, right? And the, and the, you know, I'll be there if something better come, something better doesn't happen and things like that. We just have to plow through that. Those aren't kingdom values. There's Summit County things. That's cool. But that's not a kingdom thing. So if we're going to ever live out the kingdom, then that can't be okay forever. At some point, you have to say, enough. Commit or not. If you're going to be a part of a family, you have to be with us. You have to spend time together. There's no shortcut to that. There is no consumer thing in a discipleship culture. We don't get to just come and consume. I'm not even talking to you guys. I just mean in general, right, out there? We are not to be consumers. We are to be producers as disciples. We are to have enough. We are to have so much of each of these capitals that we have more to give. That's what wealth means. Well-being in every area well-being, so that there is enough. Now, some, one person might have $100 and one person might have a million dollars, but if the person with $100 has more than what he needs and gives some of it away, he's living by the kingdom. And if the person who has a million dollars doesn't give a shred of it to anybody else, I don't think so. So it doesn't matter how much we have. What matters is that we have enough and we give it away, right? So spiritual capital, love, power, and wisdom, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I mean, if the day of his return was drawing near 2,000 years ago, then we're probably getting closer and closer, right? I love this. You know what? They got together in so many different ways in in the New Testament. It reminds me of how we try to do it. And all these different levels and all these different places, sometimes we're here, sometimes it's in the bulletin, sometimes somebody's calling somebody up, sometimes it's a poker night, sometimes it's a movie night, sometimes it's caroling, sometimes it's a huddle, sometimes it's formal, sometimes it's informal, sometimes it's organized, unorganized, whatever. Paul was saying, or sorry, whoever wrote Hebrews, which we don't know, was saying, hey, don't stop doing that. In whatever space you're getting together, keep doing that because we need each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to challenge each other. We need to actually sit around and think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. So I'll ask myself, am I really increasing my spiritual capital and giving it to anyone else? Because have I thought today about how to motivate someone else toward an act of love or good works? Have I said to somebody, have I prayed for someone, have I said, hey, this is a beautiful thing in you. We are all blessed to be around it. Have I said, you are loved? Have I said, hey, nice hat. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't have to even be fancy. It just needs to be something that's active. So, so that was an amazing way that you taught that person how to do that. Why don't you do that more? You could do that. We could do anything. I mean, honestly, if the power of the Holy Spirit's behind it, whatever he tells us to do, we can do. And that's motivating one another toward acts of love and good works. That is spiritual capital. Am I motivating people in that way? Am I giving spiritual capital to anybody else? Am I giving spiritual capital away as the Lord wants me to? And how can I do that more in 2016? Relational capital. 1 Thessalonians 5, 13 through 15. It's actually in the same passage as the one that we read before. Get along among yourselves, each of you doing your part. Our counsel is that you warn the freeloaders to get a move on. That's, that's a lot. That's Summit County. <laughs> get a move on, freeloaders. I love it. That's challenge, right? That's what we talk about, challenge. It's not all nice and fuzzy and everybody feeling good all the time. It's like, dude, work. That's part of this. You don't get to be a family without contributing something. Get a, get a move on. Gently encourage the stragglers. So there's another strategy there. Reach out for the exhausted, pulling them to their feet. 
Be patient with each person, attentive to individual needs. That's invitation. Patience, grace, love, watching out for every individual need. I was just talking to someone the other week about how they're wired and this is a gift that she has to see needs. It comes out in things like hospitality, to set up a room well, or to ask somebody when they walk in if they'd like a beverage. I mean, things like this I'm in awe of. Like, you think like that. That's amazing. Not everybody thinks like that. I don't. I'm like, get it yourself. There's a cabinet. And my kid is going to hang on you before they run out the door. Um, be patient and be careful that when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. Remember when we talked about this in more depth? Be careful that when you get on each other's nerves. This is what relational capital means, that we are living in such proximity with one another that the question is not if, but when. I love it. Paul's like, hey, if you're really doing this thing right, you're going to rub each other the wrong way. If you're not rubbing each other the wrong way at some point, you're not in community. You're still a guest. You're not quite family. Now, I'm just about to spend a whole week with my family and I can tell you, we rub each other all sorts of the wrong ways. My sister's coming from all over the country. We got kids we're not used to. We've got dynamics we're not used to. Somebody doesn't get the room they wanted at the house. Somebody, you know, it is rubbing each other the wrong way the whole time. And when we get on each other's nerves, that's our goal. Don't snap at each other. You know, we're hoping for no, no more than two big blowouts over the course of the week. That's the way my family functions. We take care of each other. We show kindness to each other at our best, Right? But if we're just always so polite that nothing ever happens and there's no friction and... I mean, I know it might seem weird, but that is really what we're doing. Somebody's not speaking the truth if there's never any of that. So when we get on each other's nerves, don't snap at each other. For the love of God, don't just walk away, which is what we're very used to doing in America. Because now all of a sudden I've tried to consume and what I was consuming isn't quite good enough Almost like I paid for this product and it wasn't exactly what I ordered. So I'm going to return it and I'm going to go find a different product that's better. Now that's fine for a consumer mentality, but it's not right for discipleship. When we get on each other's nerves, we don't snap at each other, but we look for the best in each other. Here's what the Lord is saying to me. Look for the best in people, Lila, and always do your best to bring it out. If I could die one day and that be my mantra, I would. I would be probably still not happy because I'd be dying. But I would be, I would feel content that my life had meant something. That I always saw the best. Can you imagine? I know those people. I have a few of those people in my life. I'm in awe. How do you always see the best? Now, I guess there's something to be said for ways to motivate. I don't know. We were talking about our personality, which is very similar. We're twins. On the way down, I'm like, yeah, okay. I can see the whole, like, kick somebody in the rear and get a moving thing, which is really more what we're into. But, you know, do seeing the best in people, like, that's the goal. For me, this year, God has already spoken to me. Start looking for the best and bring it out. Stop worrying so much about everything being just right or just perfect or moving everybody from A to B, which is a gift but also can be a real bummer, right? (laughs) Sometimes, so... That's what we are to do with our relational capital. Whoever you have in your life, ask the Lord tonight. Is there somebody that I can move? We are not looking to receive more. We are looking to give more. And when we give it, here's the beautiful thing. When I become a person of peace for someone else, all of a sudden I look around and I have people of peace around. I have people who want to love me and serve me and be around me. When I need people all the time, somehow they all disappear. (laughs) Because when we're always needy and we're never giving, but we're always looking to receive... So what happens is the Lord puts a floor on that, puts a bottom on that pit of need. The Lord only does that. No person does it. No activity does it. No amount of wealth does it. The Lord puts it on. And he says, you are loved more than you ever will be by anybody else. Be satisfied. We say, oh, awesome. Well, now I have something to give. And it turns around and we start pouring it out, right? So with relational capital, when we are actually living alongside people, this is what we do. This is when we have to activate what we talked about last week, the last sermon of Advent, love. We talked about how love is on the other side of disillusionment. You know, what our society calls love is actually infatuation, and what our society calls failure is actually just disillusionment, and disillusionment is really just the painful gaining of reality. And it's painful because we love our illusions. But especially with other people, if we can just push through it, and get to the other side and say, I don't like you right now, but (laughs) I love you. And so let's just get through it. You are not who I needed you to be right then, but you're a person and I'm a person. And sometimes I'm probably not what you need me to be. So let's just get through it, right? We get on the other side of it. We find true love. 
So could God be speaking to you um, about how you can invest more in relational capital this year? All right, physical capital. I don't spend much time on this. Time and health. This is just kind of like the base of what we have. Sometimes we find, and it's not just when we find we have nothing else, but sometimes we find we're sort of lacking in other areas to give. If we are lacking finances at the time, we can't give money for something, or if we're, you know, I don't have anything spiritual right now to give anybody. I'm, I'm sapping it away from everybody I know because I'm just barely getting by. Like, we all have seasons like that, right? But what we can give is time. You can go help somebody with something. If you're healthy and somebody's not, you know, you can go do something that they can't do on their own. I mean, this is, again, last spring break, this is how we met Mike Gamash. He came hobbling into Rocky Mountain Coffee Roasters with a boot and could not hardly move. We ended up sitting at the same table working on stuff because I was like, dude, you can sit at this table. I'm not using the whole thing. And over the course of it, I mean, we kind of stayed in touch. And then some bunch of kids came in during spring break and I was like, Mike probably can't clean his car out. I mean, he, he can't drive. He can't do anything. And so these kids came in and drove him around town because he had this boot on his driving foot, drove him all over the county, walked his dog, who was, which was going crazy by this point because he couldn't keep up with the, the thing, and just cleaned out his car, vacuumed in places he couldn't get. I mean, did they, they didn't give anything that cost them anything except their time. That's it. So in what ways this year? Now, Jesus was an, a phenomenal example of this. I mean, I could tell a thousand stories, obviously. The fact that he came from heaven to earth as a tiny little infant baby that had to have his diapers changed, you know what I'm saying? Like, he obviously gave his time. <laughs> he didn't have to do any of that. He gave his whole life. And all along his life, and in those three years of ministry, we see him again and again and again being interrupted from interruptions to serve people, to love his disciples, to say, really, you still don't get that? <laughs> like, which must have been the most fabulous part of his whole life here is like, my disciples, you're going to start the church and institute the kingdom of God. Could you please get this through your head? Um, <laughs> anyway, or, you know, the crowds of people that were like, Hosanna, Hosanna, we love you. Actually, just crucify him a week later because he's not who we need him to be. He gave all of that for us and still does, you know. That's, this is, we are his kiddos, so whatever we need from him, he has time for us. We're the ones who don't usually have time for him because we got really busy lives, right? It's God who's usually standing by saying, I'm around, just here if you need me. So to give our time and our health to someone who doesn't have it, there are a thousand opportunities over the course of the year to volunteer here in Summit County. But even beyond the formal opportunities that we have, and I hope we give you lots of opportunities as a church, because really, that's part of it. We want to be serving people together. That's powerful. But no matter what you find to do, you might have a neighbor who needs their, their walk shoveled you know, you might have somebody who, um, what, the, something in a person's bathroom wasn't working and Kyle knew how to fix it. Giving away that stuff. So give it away. Maybe God is talking to you about that. The next one is intellectual capital. Creativity and knowledge. I won't read this whole scripture, but this is about Pharaoh grabbing Joseph. I know Joseph had a dream that kind of saved millions millions of people in his day. Um, Pharaoh had a dream. Joseph interpreted it, I guess, through the Holy Spirit. I mean, it never actually says the Holy Spirit gives him the interpretation, just says he interpreted it, kind of like Daniel. He had this crazy wisdom, and he had this knowledge in how to do things that I guess must have been innate because nobody taught him, I guess. Although was, I don't, maybe, it's, maybe he learned some stuff from his father. But in general, this creativity and knowledge that Joseph had, it's very safe to assume not everybody had that kind of intellectual capital. Because when he interprets this dream and they decide, oh, when these seven years of plenty happen and every other nation is just eating themselves crazy, we're going to set some of it aside because then seven years of famine are going to come and everybody's going to starve to death. And in the end, what ends up happening is not only does he save the entire nation of Egypt, his own people and family come as far as Israel to get grain. So he ends up saving multiple nations of people because of this. And they say this, they say, Pharaoh says, hey, we need to find somebody who's really discerning and wise to put in charge of the entire operation. And they say, why not Joseph? And this is the idea, guys. I know, it, again, some of these things seem unspiritual, but they're not. God has given us knowledge in things. He's given us ideas about things. I mean, I didn't know Andrew could play the guitar until he did it in prayer. And then we're like, what? Andrew, why are you not doing this, you know? I mean, there's all these things that we have that we think, meh, it's okay, it's not perfect. But they're good, and somebody else doesn't have them. I don't know how to play the guitar, you know what I'm saying? I don't know how to do half, a fraction of the things that are in your brains. 
I don't know any of that stuff. And you know what? A lot of other people don't either. You have a wealth of knowledge and creativity inside of you that other people around you don't have. Because some of it's unconscious competence, we might assume sometimes that someone else knows how to do all the things that we know how to do. I really still don't know how to change my oil if I ever had to. I don't, I don't know how to do stuff. I need somebody to come teach me. So simple things to unbelievably complex things. We are to give away our intellectual capital to one another. If you know how to do something, then help. Excellent example. Last March, we had all these students wandering around passing out cookies, and we had to have some sort of organized way to make sure that they covered as many areas as possible without duplicating it over and over, and people weren't crossing over each other, and it was somewhat organized. It was very, very difficult, I have to tell you. And guess who helped us with that? The engineer. Okay, so Lydia's an engineer, and she mapped out the entire county, basically, And planned all that ahead of time because that's how her brain works. And she has all this intellectual capital that she gave. Now, most of the people who received, Pam didn't know she received those cookies that Lydia did all that work. But because of her intellectual capital being given, all that stuff was able to happen. When we bottle that thing up because either we think it's not valuable or we just don't have time to teach people or give those things away, there's somebody who's not receiving something from God because of it. So I am here to encourage you that you have intellectual capital that you can give away. There's something you know how to do. Last year when we talked about financial capital, Eric sat down and did budgets with people. I mean, I'm just going to ask. This is not about your current state of budgeting, but anybody here, who here, your parents sat you down and taught you how to make a monthly budget? Raise your hand, please. Andrew. Okay. You know, the 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 other than Dave Ramsey, the guru on this is Eric and his parents didn't teach him. No, I don't know a single, now I do know a single person, literally, whose parents have taught them to have, now our kids will learn, they're already learning, you know, but just we're not taught these things. So how would we know how to use our money wisely? Somebody has to teach us. And that's someone bringing forth their intellectual capital to say, I don't know, we sat down with dozens when we lived in Missouri of people who thought they didn't have enough money to make it through the month. Who did? And they had spare. They just didn't know what they were doing with it. And so to teach somebody that thing, you know, Sarah Alford, who's here every week, she gave a testimony one night. They have paid off thousands of dollars in the last six months. And they're not wealthy, but just because of being on a budget. So I think it's probably affected their life in some way. Now, Eric could have said, I have other things to do with my time, or nobody's going to be interested in that. And they wouldn't have been impacted the same way. Their children will have a college fund this coming year. And they have already started a retirement account because of that simple, simple thing. Now, they might be putting $4 aside a month. Who knows? But it's something, right? So give away your intellectual capital. Maybe God is speaking to you about something that you know or some ideas that you have that could help. Maybe they can help this church. Maybe they help somebody in it. Maybe they help somebody outside of it. Whoever. And then last is financial capital. Financial capital is, in the old days, it could have been cattle and a thousand things, but let's be real. It's money, right? And things which are bought with money. So it's really money. 1 John three sixteen through 18. This is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears. And you made it disappear. Woo! John is in a fierce mood. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. Because it doesn't do anybody any good for us to say, we should do that and then not do it, right? So I'm going to encourage you to think about a percentage that you will give. Now, I'm going to encourage you to tithe. Tithe is giving 10% of your income. Now, if you're not starting with giving 10% of your income, it will seem like a whole lot, especially living here. But we've all chosen to live here. Let's be real. <laughs> Nobody is, we don't get stuck here. I mean, I lived in Springfield, Missouri for years. People get stuck there. It's, it is, what, $120 to $100 or something. I mean, your money goes so far that everybody's like, I am never going to find another house like this anywhere else. I'm staying here. I got a pool and 16 acres for the same thing that we pay for our townhouse, right? I mean, people get stuck there, and it, they can be kind of grumpy, honestly, because they're stuck. Here, I mean, if you ever wondered why there's so many happy people, nobody's stuck here. We all know that we're blessed to live here. But we don't get to say, I'm not going to ever give anything away in order to be blessed to live here. Does that make sense? 
because I need new skis or I, I need new things or I need to eat out a lot or I need, this is what the budget does. It frees us up to be able to say, whoa, holy smokes, I'm spending that much on that? Is God okay with that? Because most of the time we just don't know. And to say, if we, if we gave away that, $1,000 will buy something like, I should have figured this out before I came because I was just looking in the Heifer International catalog before we came because we're going shopping with our kids this week in that catalog. $1,000, I don't know how far it will get you in Summit County, but I can tell you how far it'll get you around the world. Like two cows, about four or five goats for a community, a bunch of little chickies. I think this is, these are the things that our kids are picking out to send overseas. Think about it. How far can just not very much go? Really far for a lot of people. Or I can have another Thai latte, right? Tithe. Give 10%. Here's what, I mean, honestly, we have always, our entire marriage, given 10% to whatever church we go to and then over and above to everything else. We support missionaries. We give away a chunk. Every time we go somewhere, because we're missionaries with the Assemblies of God, we raise money. This is how we don't get paid to do this. We go somewhere and we say, by the way, a big chunk of what you send us is probably going to go to someone else. We had a family in Ohio send a box of clothes for our kids that still had the tags on, which I got to tell you, we don't see very often because we don't buy new clothes for our kids because why would we? We've got FERC, right? And that money can go somewhere else with people who can actually buy something instead of a $35 Gap sweater for a four-year-old, right? (laughs) It's like, why, why, why would we do that? The kingdom of God is at hand and, and people are hurting, you know? And we have way, way, way more than enough. I love to see people who have very little giving away what they have. I'm astonished. You know, sometimes I say, one of Eric's gifts is to take a small amount of something and expand it. I mean, if we have a car, he's making money off the car. If we have a room, we've got a nanny to watch the kids two days so we don't have to pay for child. I mean, the man can stretch money. When I see that with giving with people, you have this much and yet you will give half of it? Like you have a sandwich and you'll give away half of it. You know what I'm saying? I love it. It is so beautiful because most of us, when we have too much, we don't want to give anything. I have too much. Now it all matters too much. It all means something. All of these things. If we don't have all these things, we can't be satisfied and content. How many things do we need? We divide up our giving here at home and overseas. We support missionaries that minister to people right here in the U.S. because I know I can say money goes so much further than it does, but there is also need here. And then we send money to things overseas. Every time we get an, we have a standard by which we give a certain percentage. Every time we get this amount, we give away. Um, I'll be honest, we got a chunk from my mother's death. And it has been the biggest fun of our lives this year. We cannot give it all away. We're like, who else? Now? I mean, we've got it set aside. It's not our money. It's basically like monopoly money at this point. That's just really fun to spend because it doesn't belong to us because we already told the Lord we would give that. And even though it's a tragedy that brought it our way, somebody's going to benefit. You know what I'm saying? And it's not just going to be us. Somebody is going to get something awesome this year because we, had, we got extra. What do we need it for? <laughs> We have enough. I almost feel like we cannot give it away fast enough. I don't know what it is. God is so good. When I'm just talking about the Ojalas right now, like we have never, I mean, Eric and I sit down and talk about it. We're like, we still haven't given to the point of hurt. We keep giving and giving and giving and it still never hurts because he keeps giving more. Do you know what I'm saying? Like God just keeps doing that. But I think that's the flow that's supposed to happen. He's not going to give us more if he knows we're just going to use it on ourselves. What's the fun in that? We could actually help transform people's lives by what we give. So I'm going to encourage you, 10% of your income, give here if this is your home. And take another chunk and give it somewhere else. Support a missionary somewhere or send it to Compassion International. I know there are tons of people in this church right now. There are people in this church who support Matthew and Elora, who were here on our team for years and are now planning a church in Denver. There are people who are supporting people all over. Do that. Do it generously. Send extra. Most of the time around Christmas, missionaries don't get anything because people are spending all their money on themselves and their kids, you know? Send extra. So maybe the Lord's talking to you about financial capital. Now, our church never talks about this except to say there's a box, give if you want. But I'm going to just tell you, Just do it. Let's just see what happens. If we have an abundance, let me tell you what's going to happen. Somebody else is going to get it. 
That's how we function. We're not greedy church people who are just trying to take people's money. What are we going to do with it anyway? Buy nicer coffee? I don't know. What do we spend money on? Nothing. It will go to somebody. It will go to buy somebody Christmas presents or whatever. A trip to India. We're supporting missionaries in India right now. We're supporting an orphanage of 30 children. We have a picture of them in our house because we also do it personally. But our church supports this orphanage, begging us to come to India and meet them. They pray for our church every day. These children. I could get another scarf. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Financial capital. Maybe God's speaking to you. So what is God saying to me? Just pause for a minute and just let the Lord speak to you about everything that I've talked about tonight. And if you've been around this year, you've heard these sermons. We've talked about it all year, but in what area do you feel... You know, when we talk about God speaking to us, it doesn't have to be like a voice in our head. Sometimes it's just like you keep coming back to that one thing. That's probably the Holy Spirit saying, mm -mm, tug, tug, tug. Here's what I want to do this year. What's God saying to me? And what am I going to do about it? And that, my friends, is not aspirational 10 years from now. It is this week, this month, this year. Because if we want to say at the end of 2006 we grew in an area, we have to make really practical steps. Not just going to happen on its own. American culture, the world, like I mean the world, the globe, Summit County culture is going to drag us off somewhere else. Lord, you're good. And I really hope tonight, I know it's probably been challenged, but I really hope tonight everybody has sensed, is really walking away with a sense of how much you love us because you've given us so much. The only thing you ask for in return is all of it back. So tonight we hold out to you all of these capitals, everything that we've built in these areas. Maybe we have a wealth of knowledge in some way, and we've really worked hard for that, but it still belongs to you. Because we're not our own anymore. We were bought with a price. Your blood, and so we're yours. And so we hold it out to you and say, if we have shrunk back from giving that away in any way, let us be generous with it. In any of these areas, Lord, we offer it to you. We hold it out and say, to, to open our hands instead of hoarding it to ourselves, instead of worrying and having fear that we won't have enough, we want to use it well, we want to be smart with it, and we want to give it away. And if that means we don't have as nice as stuff at the end of 2016, I think that'll be okay. But I have a feeling, Lord, you're just going to keep pouring more and more and more into us so we can give it out. Lord, let us be a people. Let us be a church of givers, of generous people who receive from you and give it away as fast as we get it. And Lord, I pray for blessings on my friends. I pray that this year would be packed tight with power and love and wisdom that they would receive way more knowledge and creativity than they can possibly imagine that they would have good friends and family come around because they are good friends and family to others that they would have more time than they know what to do with and you would fill it fill it fill it with your kingdom work that they would be healthy that they would be blessed and I pray for abundant finances I pray for abundance Lord so that we can give it away you're good God and really, all of this is just based on you and your example. So let us be like you in this. Let us have a really, really good year. I love you, Lord. Amen. Okay, well, we are done. Thank you guys for coming and for listening and for not falling asleep. Um, and we will be back here next week. So take your time, have some coffee, chat, and have a wonderful, wonderful New Year's. Good night.